My name is Lyle Asher, and I teach English at uh, Lewis and Clark College in Portland. I um, got my PhD in Renaissance literature at the University of Virginia, and have been teaching f at Lewis and Clark for the last 25 years. Nice. Have you seen changes at your school in, in the last 25 years? And if so, what, what's the most notable change? Yes, um, for me, and it differs from school to school, uh, when this change is most evident. For me, it happened uh, about 10 years ago um, in 2010. And that's when I noticed that um, college administrators were taking on uh, greater and greater roles on, on campus and doing and saying some pretty outrageous things that most people had never heard before. Certainly, certainly I hadn't. And suddenly we had all these um, problems with administrators uh, trying to clamp down on speech, uh, claiming that particular forms of uh, discussion and activity were uh, racist. And this happened at Lewis and Clark from 2010, and it really hasn't led up since. Wow. What are some of the examples of the crazy things that they would say? Well, um, the example I gave in the Chronicle piece was uh, a student who had some posters had gone up anonymously around campus, and these post posters were intended to be anti-racist posters that were uh, satirical. They were mocking, uh, if you can believe it, uh, an invitation to a luau, which the sat satirist was thought was were racist. I don't think they were racist, but what then happened was that the satirical posters were considered racist by administrators and the student was uh, brought up on charges. Before he was brought up on charges, it was uh, just assumed that it was um, some white racist student and it was discovered in uh, the course of a couple of days that in fact he was a minority student who was very vehemently anti-racist. Uh, but to sort of keep up appearances, they went ahead and punished the student anyway, charged him and convicted him of, among other things, uh, racial harassment. And again, because this was in 2001, we could get uh, a number of faculty fighting it, and we did, and, but it still took six months to get those student convictions uh, overturned. Wow. Was that at Lewis and Clark? That was at Lewis and Clark, yes. Okay. Um, what are some other experiences you've had there that have, that have um, been a negative? Well, three years later, you know, we many of us had thought that we were um, we'd we'd settled the issue. Three years later, a academic dean broadcast to the faculty on a faculty meeting that there had been racist chanting on campus, and it was quite disturbing to hear what the story that she told. The story, it turned out, was based on hearsay, but the story she told was of many students in a dormitory one night. Uh, shouting racial epithets and, and white power. Naturally, the faculty was taken aback, and so we scheduled a meeting for five days later. We were all very eager to hear what, what we were going to do and what this was about. Only later did I discover that uh, in between that announcement and the meeting that we had five days later, a conduct hearing had taken place in which it was discovered there had never been any racist chanting. In fact, something like the opposite of that um, it was a group of uh, football players, uh, and it was a sort of interracial gathering. And it turned out that at the center of it all was a black student and a white student who were both close friends, both on the football team, and they were fist bumping um, uh, N-I-G-G-A, the black student said, uh, uh, a term of endearment, a version of the N-word that he was using as a term of endearment for his good and close friend, a white student who fist bumped him back with white power. This was an ongoing joke between them. Well, so you would have thought that at some point the dean and the administrators would have come back and said, well, we made a terrible mistake. In fact, we have very good news. It's just the opposite of what we thought this was. It wasn't racist chanting, but in fact, an interracial friendship. Uh, but they didn't do that. They uh, let that narrative continue uh, for, well, the next seven months. And no matter how many letters, open letters I wrote, they wouldn't even acknowledge them. And finally, uh, the upshot, which was just unbelievable, the black student was uh, 
not only charged, but convicted of uh, racial harassment. And he left campus rather than uh, submit to these ridiculous punishments based on uh, just bogus charges. Wow. What was his punishment? I don't really know. I think he was supposed to write an apology and various other things. But I don't in the end think that anybody thought he was actually guilty of these things. Uh, they just realized that they had, they had covered it up. <laughs> they made a mistake at the beginning. And instead of telling the truth, they had covered it up. So it became very difficult for them to defend themselves. In fact, not only would the president or any of the administrators at the time, not only would they not respond to my open emails to the entire campus community, asking them probing questions because I knew a great deal about it. They didn't even acknowledge these letters. So after four months, I turned them into fire along with the students. They submitted statements to fire the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And uh, the administration remained absolutely silent. We referred to it as Hitler's bunker. And they, they, because they, they, they couldn't tell the truth because at that point they were implicated in this cover-up. Right, right. So th this sort of thing and deplatforming and clamping down on speech and just kind of bizarre experiences in, in colleges have been happening for a while now. It seems to be escalating, and I'm, and I'm wondering um, why you think that is. What those two events on my own campus taught me was I began looking into it more and more. And then I noticed online just how I, I, initially I thought that it was a problem that was um, really just focused or centered in at Lewis and Clark. I thought it was we had made a, several bad hires uh, of administrators. But then I noticed it was happening everywhere. And I noticed the same kind of language being spoken. And I also noticed that it was mostly administrators who were doing it. So that be, set me on a path of trying to find out who these administrators were, where they'd gone to school, what they'd been trained in. And that's really when the door began opening. And that's when I realized that, you know, the vast majority, upwards of 80 percent of student-facing administrators, and by student-facing administrators, I don't mean provosts or dean of students, but or, or academic deans, but um, deans of students, uh, people who work uh, in the dormitories, uh, those people who deal with students every day, those administrators um, have been trained for the most part at schools of education, teacher training schools, which for most of their history have been teaching K through 12 teachers. They only really got into the college administrative training really in the last 30 years, since around 1990. And now that has just blossomed. And so we're getting these administrators who come from these really sort of disastrous institutions known as ed schools. And they've really been the source of, I'd say, most of the problems that we've been seeing for the last uh, 15 years. Can you give a concise definition of what an ed school is? Yeah. Um, uh, an education school is a school which, um, let me f first say that there are sort of three different kinds. When we talk about an ed school, we can, we can mean an undergraduate program that has an uh, education department, so you can measure an education, right? And that, that's a, a number of schools do that. Take Lewis and Clark, for example. We don't have an undergraduate education major, but we have a graduate school in education. So you would get a four-year degree, let's say, in, you know, in English literature, let's say, or sociology. And then you would spend uh, a couple of years getting your master's at the ed school. So, and then there's a, so most of these ed schools are connected to universities, either as an undergraduate degree you can get or a combination of an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree. And then, then there are also standalone uh, ed schools, very few of them actually, but standalone ed schools that aren't explicitly connected with a university. Teachers College is probably the most famous, but Teachers College was for a long time uh, directly associated with Columbia University. Uh, that connection has been severed, though everybody probably still thinks they're, they're connected. There are about 1,500 uh, education schools in the United States um, right now. It seems like quite a, quite a lot. Yes, it is quite a lot. Uh, to give you an idea of, of um, how many edu education schools there are and maybe how many there should be, uh, Canada, 
one-tenth the size of the United States only has 50. But if they had the number of ed schools in proportion to their population, they would have 150. So one of the problems is we have too many ed schools who are looking for students because the students bring in money. And by the way, the money then goes to the other parts of the university. So the universities are implicated in this from the very beginning. So one of the things that's happened is that they have uh, lowered standards, they've lowered graduation requirements because they're after students. And so it is, uh, it is a kind of buyer's market. Right. And you know, obviously, we've been we've been doing this this series uh, separately on on how these ed schools turned into something like indoctrination centers. Can you say a little bit about that and and um, how that came about? Yes, uh, in some ways, we have to go back around you know about a hundred years. Uh, it's a historical accident, like so many things are in <laughs> in education history in the United States. It just so happened that when ed schools were really coming into being uh, in uh, the early 1900s, when we realized that we needed lots of teachers to teach the new children of people who were now going, mostly coming into cities, but also were just in the nation as a whole, uh, we needed teachers to be trained. And so these education schools for training teachers uh, began multiplying. There had already been education schools, but they really began multiplying. And that happened at just the time when um, progressivism, uh, which was a political movement from roughly around 1890 until the beginning of the First World War, but it continues on after that, when the progressive movement was... Uh, in full force in the United States, and then there was a progressive education movement as well. And this progressive education movement had um, a very confident sense of the power of education to transform society by means of education. And uh, it's hard, I think, to summarize easily what progressive education means, but one of the things it means for most of the promoters of uh, progressive education was that we should not do what we've been doing in the past in the 19th century, putting students in chairs, drilling them on sort of memorizing facts, the old idea of, you know, the, the dismal sort of schoolroom that everybody fears. And there was some truth in that. So there was some good things to be said about the progressive education movement. But the problem was, too, that Progressivism, as it developed in the 20s and 30s, uh, became closely associated with, um, of all things, the Russian Revolution, because people like John Dewey and Counts were very impressed by what they were seeing in the, uh, the Soviet Union. It's worth remembering, of course, at the time that there was, uh, you know, this was the time when, when people in the United States, when workers' rights were, there was almost no such thing, when people were really working in miserable factory jobs. So you can understand what the attraction was to uh, the Russian Revolution, which now, in retrospect, looks like a horror show. But this meant, however, that ed schools were, from the beginning, leaning heavily towards uh, a kind of collectivist vision of social construction. And that's really never left them. And this continues right up through uh, the 60s and 70s. And then there was a, in the 60s and 70s, when the uh, anti-war demonstrations were really hitting college campuses in full force. This gave new life to a kind of leftist uh, political lean in ed schools in particular. And they've been kind of the, uh, the espresso version of left-leaning uh, academic politics uh, ever since. So what do you mean by espresso version? Well, they're kind of a concentrated version of it. You know, when I was in graduate school, you could just assume, and college too, you could just assume that the vast majority of faculty were on the left. That is, they voted for Democrats. Most of them would consider themselves center-left or, or left. I didn't know of anybody. I didn't know about anyone's actual politics, but, and I'm sure there were a few people who were conservative, but you got a very strong sense that this was a, that most academics were left. Nevertheless, <clears throat> there was always um, uh, an attempt to uh, bring in different points of view. Uh, 
when I was an undergraduate, you would bring people to campus. Um, I saw people on the right and left debating, uh, and so that was not really a that wasn't really an issue. When, when you were talking, I was thinking um, about you know what Jonathan Hyde has talked about and others who have have said that um, you know the ac- uh, academicians have mostly been left leaning, uh, especially lately. And, you know, a lot of people think that that's totally normal and, and fine. And I'm wondering if you can ex- express why that could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, I'll, I'll also answer your first question a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah. A- academicians have, have always leaned left, uh, certainly since uh, the 60s and 70s. Keep in mind that, you know, colleges and universities in the United States enrolled about three million people in uh, 1965. Uh, Ten years later, that number was six million. So we had really taken 100 years to get the population of college students up to three million, and then in a single decade, we doubled it. Another historical accident, this means that between 1965 and 1975, when the population of students doubled, this was at the very height of the anti-war uh, movement on on campus, and this meant that we were pushed even further in the direction of political leftism. And so, those people who were going to school and getting their graduate degrees from 1965 and 1975, they came of age uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And so, all the people who had, let's say, fought in World War II or gone to graduate school with the GI Bill. Those people were gradually retiring. And so what we have now and what we had really for the last 20 or 30 years are people who went to college and went to graduate school at the height of the the Vietnam War. And that had such a huge influence, I think, on their outlook. And it's been with us really ever since. Right. And, and then I'm wondering if you can touch on why it could be problematic to have you know, these uh, academicians and, and administrators mostly be left-leaning? Like what's the, why is it important to have? Well, what, one reason it's um, a problem to have left-leaning uh, academics, especially now, is that in the old days, you didn't always know that um, your professor was left-leaning because he or she was trying to present both sides of a case. And this had been my experience, really, uh, as an undergraduate and really throughout graduate school. You could be open about what your politics were, but nobody really, you felt, was tilting the, the, the board in one direction or another. That is completely gone now, as far as I can tell. People are not only uh, clear about what their political beliefs are, they are, uh, and I, you know, this is a generalization, but I think it's, it's mostly true, now they're more willing than ever to not only shut down opposing points of view, but um, also make it clear that that's what they will do and intimidate people into silence. Now, this uh, has an, uh, a particularly bad effect if you are trying to uh, talk about uh, issues that are controversial, that the American people are divided on, whether it has to do with race or global warming or climate change or uh, policing and um, this sort of thing. These are all issues that really demand a hearing and an open, uh, open minds. And students, uh, for the most part, are not getting that. They're getting one side of the story. And they get this not only, of course, in colleges and universities, but they get it now in uh, K through 12 as well. Right. You mentioned that one of the goals or principles of the ed schools was to transform society. Can you talk a little bit about that and and um, and just the the influence they've had on social justice. Well, social justice is of course uh, an Im- important uh, topic. Of course, it means a variety of things. Social justice is a goal. Uh, it is not a means. At least that's the way one used to think about it. Social justice is a conversation which, in many ways, has uh, gone on since Plato. Plato was talking about uh, social justice. In fact, he was in his own way talking about equality of opportunity. He was talking about equity without using those words. But if you go back and read The Republic, you realize that um, Plato was deeply concerned about these things. 
And he was in some ways, um, even though he's dismissed as a dead white male, in, in some ways uh, he is on the side of equity as it's understood today. Uh, for example, he thought it was uh, irresponsible to leave children in the care of their parents since most of them had uh, no clue. They were not experts in how to raise children, so he thought it would be a good idea to remove children from bad parents and parents generally and have them trained by, by experts in virtue. So uh, he was in some ways uh, a, quite a totalitarian, at least in the Republic. That's the idea. But this conversation has been going on uh, in, in most of Western history. So social justice, again, is, a, is the topic of a conversation. But in the last 10 years, especially, it's been transformed. Social justice is now a set of beliefs, uh, which are not considered to be beliefs. They're considered to be inarguable truths, self-evident truths that you can get training in. I mean, the very word training tells you all you need to know about how social justice is understood. It's possible to get training in, in you know, Windows 10 or I guess now 11. It's possible to get uh, training in CPR, but you can't get training in social justice and have the word social justice mean anything. What does it mean to the people who are, are pushing it? Well, social justice, uh, typically, if you just went down the list, you'd find that it means you have a particular view about um, climate change. You have particular views, um, generally speaking, about redistributions of income. You have a typical, you have a view about capitalism, namely that it's bad and needs to be overthrown. You also typically adopt the view that capitalism is responsible for uh, racism. It's responsible for patriarchy. And these views, um, even though they're contradicted by Marx himself, Marx pointed out in the Communist Manifesto that patriarchy was one of the many things that would be dissolved by capitalism. <laughs> and he didn't necessarily think that was a good thing, by the way. So uh, these things are just handed to students in a kind of, and to be memorized in a kind of rote fashion. Um, and that means that when you ha try to have a discussion with some of these students, by no means all, maybe not even most, uh, you find yourself um, confronting people who have a kind of religious conviction about really what are intellectual topics. And, and can you say a little bit about, um, I just want to make sure that the link is clear between ed schools and then how they uh, you know, train teachers and then how those teachers then um, sure. bring it to K through 12 okay, schools? Yeah. Ed schools combine uh, two things that have proven to be quite toxic. Um, one is very low academic standards, and two, a kind of political orthodoxy. And one of the things that distinguishes ed schools from uh, most colleges and universities in which one has a, you know, a, a department of political science and a department of um, sociology. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you still have a wide variety of opinion in these departments. And even in English departments, there was lots and lots of infighting, people having different ideas about not only the direction of uh, the profession, what values should be forwarded uh, you had lots of um, uh, conversations, disagreements, uh, and that's really vital for a serious intellectual enterprise. Um, ed schools from very early on have been themselves uh, kind of closed off from that. It's been very much, and perhaps this is, be, this is due to the fact that they've been considered a kind of intellectual backwater they have a kind of defensive posture, and they have almost behaved like a cult from, for the last 30 or 40 years. Anytime anyone has tried to uh, suggest other ways of doing things in ed schools, uh, they are very uh, typically kicked out. Uh, they're shamed or shunned. So in some ways, the, this preceded by about 30 years what's now happening on college campuses.
And can you say a little bit about how those the people who are trained there then go uh, through to K through 12 schools and start teaching children? Because my, my next question is, you know, for those uh, those of us who are concerned about you know bigotry and sexism yeah. and all those things, wh why should why shouldn't people be teaching that to to, to 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 you know to kids? For many decades, people who were going into education and going in who aspired to be teachers in the K through 12 system, most of them would have to get uh, a teaching degree from an ed school, and many of them, maybe a majority, uh, considered this training to be. Uh, just a kind of obstacle in the way of getting into teaching and they had to spend money and a lot of time and they didn't consider it necessarily uh, helpful for their life as a, as a teacher. And very often the kind of politics that you saw in ed schools, uh, they could dismiss or forget once they got into K the K-12 through system. And that still happens to some degree. That is, the attempts at indoctrination tend to fall away once one teacher finds himself or herself in the classroom because there are all these practical issues one has to deal with. But that's become um, uh, less likely in, in the last uh, decade or so. In K through 12 education, what you have now are uh, teachers who are uh, trained in colleges and universities where administrators and to some degree faculty, have been pushing a kind of woke agenda. So people now going into K through 12 education who got their degrees in a college, let's say in 2010, let's say, and then they got their uh, license to teach in 2012, they know little else but this kind of woke political drift that we've seen in colleges and universities. And now they take that back into the K through 12 system. Right, and what's, what's wrong with you know, trying to teach students to transform society and, and think about social justice? The problem with teaching students to transform society is that you first have to assume that you know what the goal of society is, what the goal of this transformation is. It implies that you already have the answer to what the ideal society would be. And so to suggest to students that we know what the goal is, and we know not only the goal, but the means, you're not educating, you're indoctrinating. The subject of social justice, if it's a subject of education, means that you're going to look at all sides of the issue. When we talk, for example, um, about equality of opportunity, um, what do we mean by that? Do we mean that uh, you simply take a kid as he walks through the front door of the school and make sure that he has the same opportunities as the next person who walks through? Or do you start with his home environment? Do you say, well, since this child grew up, grew up in a poor household, we have to give him special treatment since this student who walked in the school right behind him grew up in a very wealthy household. I think most people would say, no, we can't treat those students in exactly the same way. And we do this all the time. We make special provisions for students who are behind. We have remedial education courses. So we already do this. We do this uh, sort of naturally. But all of these things involve trade-offs. And students need to be aware of the trade-offs that, um, that they're getting. They're not really aware of those trade-offs because we're just, they're just told typically that, to take an example, the state of Oregon uh, recently relaxed its graduation requirements and they said this would be equitable for students of color. Well, the question again is, uh, is this in fact equitable? Is it good to uh, graduate more students who maybe have, don't have the academic background that they ought to be having uh, when they go um, onto the job market? Uh, when employers uh, now look at people who have high school diplomas from uh, the state, do they take them seriously anymore? So these are all trade-offs you have to ask yourself. Have you now basically diminished the meaning of what it means to graduate from high school in Oregon? So all these things have very complicated consequences. And when you simply teach that equity, we know what it means, uh, social justice, we know what that means,
uh, you're simply denying the complexity of uh, the situation. Right. I'm, I've heard, you know, like schools in Seattle and elsewhere saying things like, you know, math is racist and that sort of thing. See, are, are the teachers trading off, you know, like basic academic standards for for the social justice sort of woke infused teaching? Yeah, it would be one thing if we were uh, just killing it on the academic side in K through 12 education. That is, if we were doing a serious job with reading, uh, with mathematics instruction, with writing, with American history. But the truth is we're doing a dismal job at that already. 11% of public uh, high school graduating seniors are proficient in American history. That's one in 10. So one wonders um, how they could possibly carve out more time for other subjects like uh, social justice. The truth is the best program for social justice that anyone has ever devised is a program that emphasizes sequenced content from grade to grade. And we know this because those schools that do it, like Success Academy in New York, the charter school, or the Icon charter schools in New York, they do that and what they discover when you do have a sequenced, knowledge-based, content-rich curriculum from grades one through eight, one through 12, the achievement gap between uh, black students and white students uh, disappears. Uh, so instead of teaching the subject of social justice, they in fact should be exercising it in the way they teach students. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying my channel. Um, don't forget to subscribe, and if you'd like to see more of my work, you can head on over to Locals, which is an awesome free speech platform that won't take down or flag any videos, which YouTube is known to do. It's a great platform because people want to be there and they'll engage in meaningful dialogue with you, and it's awesome. Plus, if you sign up for a paid account, you can get access to content that is exclusive to Locals. You'll find a link for that in the description below. Also, if you ever see me lying down in interviews or in any of the videos, it's because I lived with debilitating back pain for years. So I just wanted to explain that so you understand what's going on. And uh, sometimes my little dog, Nora, might make an appearance. Nora, come here. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right. Thanks, everybody.